FYI, self-serving very quickly, I know a lot of folks came by my table earlier. I opened up one of the boxes that had been shipped to the event, and I opened it up, and these were supposedly like beer glasses and mugs and stuff that we do at conventions, and it was all just shattered glass. I figured whoever handles Trump's Twitter feed must have packed the box because it was like, uh, 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 uh. I mean, it was just insane. And I'd lost all the rest of my stuff, so I had people come by the table. But all my, the rest of my swag is here. So if you want something like a mug or something, I'm not, look, I'm shameless. Come buy shit at my table. I don't have to ship it home where they can break it again, okay? So it's there. I have come here today with a warning. A warning about a creature spawned from the depths of hell, unleashed upon a generation, moving among us, unleashing its dark and destructive satanic power. It is. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The Pokemon. The Pocket Monster. Pokemon was introduced on Nintendo back in the mid-1990s for the Game Boy originally, and it became almost instantly a global phenomenon. In fact, games featuring Pokemon have sold in the order of almost 300 million copies all around the world. Well, immediately upon its initial release about 20 years ago, the God Squad was already crying foul. Now this is a classic video clip from a TV evangelist. His name is Phil Arms of Life Reach Ministries, Pasadena, Texas. He had a warning for this generation. Honest again. Teach his children how to enter into the world of witchcraft, how to cast spells, how to use psychic phenomena, how to put work supernatural powers against their enemies, how to fantasy role play. Pokemon world is a world of the demonic of the satanic. But while you might not take it quite seriously, I assure you that demons take it quite seriously. <laughs> Satan takes it quite seriously. Oh yeah. Demons and Satan take it quite seriously. Matt Slick is president of CARM, the Christian research, the Christian apologetics and research ministry. He wrote an article back in 2007 about Pokemon. It's still available on the CARM website, updated last year in July, where they asked the question, is Pokemon dangerous? And the answer came back, potentially, yes, it is. Pokemon, according to Carm, conditions the child who plays the game into accepting occult and evolutionary <laughs> principles. You see how they link those two? Is Pokemon dangerous? Potentially, yes, it is. Still quoting from Matt Slick or paraphrasing, a haunter can hypnotize you, can eat your dreams. That's a satanic power. Abra is a mind reader. Kadabra can emit negative energy and harms other people. Ghastly can make you go to sleep. Gengar laughs at your frights. Nidoran uses poison. Or is it Nidoran or Nidoran? Nidoran uses poison. Many of these creatures evolve helping to sell to children the satanic lie of evolution. In fact, here is a clip from a Pokemon thing where uh, is it Nidorino actually levels up or evolves, I'm sure in the exact fashion that Charles Darwin wrote about <laughs> in On the Origin of Species, you know, with flash and le levitation and lightning and an instantaneous, sort of a Cambrian explosion of Pokemon, I guess is what that would be. Continuing with CARM, the children taught to use these creatures to do their will by invoking colored energy cards, fights, and commands, much of it reminiscent of the occult and Eastern mysticism. Look out, Pokemon is dangerous. And two decades later, the warnings continue from people like this guy. Now, <laughs> Rick Wiles, hosts the ironically titled True News Radio Show. Just think of an unholy union between Alex Jones and William Lane Craig, and you'll probably have an idea of what he's like. And he came out with a warning last year, and he said that Pokemon Go was targeting churches with virtual digital cyber demons, going on to declare that he believed it was a magnet for demonic power. In Christian circles, there was a story being circulated wildly about uh, Time Magazine interview done with 
the creator, the inventor of Pokemon, Satoshi Chajiri, where he admitted to Pokemon's anti-Christian, even demonic influence. They were created as a backlash against his own Christian parents, tailored toward the anti-Christian and the Satanistic. Holy shit, it's the smoking gun! <laughs> the inventor of Pokemon has said it is, in fact, Satanic. Now, those of us who are products of the late 70s and throughout the 80s and to the mid-90s remember similar warnings about the devil's influence in pop culture. It was a time of fear. In many ways, it was the season of the witch, now affectionately known as the satanic panic. Christians across the United States and, in fact, around the world were in full freak-out mode about the devil. Satan is out there, and he's sneaking into our culture, pop culture. He's targeting our children, often before they're even teenagers. It's terrifying. We must protect them. There's a guy named Phil Phillips. These books were sold in Christian bookstores. Turmoil in the Toy Box was released in 1986. He followed that up with a commentary on Saturday morning cartoons called Saturday Morning Mind Control, which released in 1991. And Phillips had a warning to parents. Movement. You guys leaving my audio up back there? Just leave it up. Yes, there's a vast movement toward the occult within the cartoon and toy industry. Most people don't realize that 80% of all cartoons deal directly with the occult. And 40% of the toys on the market have occultic influence, and these are the most popular. 80% of all cartoons, 40% of all toys. And he gave specific examples. Now, these are my graphics, but they're his examples. He warned about He-Man. Why? If he's master of the universe, who must he dethrone? <laughs> right? There's only one master of the universe. You want another source of sinister forces and darkness and evil going after your young children in the 1980s. You want to see it? Check it out. <laughs> Rainbow Bright, a franchise created by Hallmark back in 1983. Now it looks innocent enough, but looks can be so deceiving. Here's a ra well, here's a Rainbow Bright uh, cereal box. And, uh, I mean, what are you saying about Rainbow Bright? Again, she's, it's a humanistic emblems and, and uh, humanistic values. Well, system. the rainbow represents the, uh, the, the uh, networking movement. of the New Age. Right. And it's interesting that she has a little five-sided star on her cheek. I don't know if you can see that on the box, but there's a little five-sided star, and it's upside down, which I'm not going to say it's used in this depiction, but that's a pentagram again. Yes. And uh, there, that's another uh, New Age and occultic symbol. So we have to be careful even with... Uh, Rainbow Bright. You want another beloved franchise from our youth that is infected with Beelzebub? How about Star Wars? Star Wars is loaded with witchery. Uh, characters like Darth Vader, who look almost exactly like the ancient Norse god Odin, and uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and there's a form of witchcraft called Obi Witchcraft, in which chanting Obi, Obi, Obi over and over again releases the power into the witches' lives. You're saying that these were actually taken, this was taken from a Norse god uh, who well, looked very much yes, like him? Yes, it looks a lot like Darth Vader. <laughs> <laughs> what the? What? what are they talking about, right? But it doesn't stop there. Oh, we love Yoda, right? Unfortunately, Yoda has been exposed as the three-fingered, three-toed beast, an ally of Satan himself. You want to see another army of satanic characters who come to destroy our children? Check these out. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Just watch, just watch the screen. But there are some things about Smurfs that we need to look at. First of all, you'll notice that they're depicted as blue with black lips. Well, isn't that interesting? And you know what happens to you when you die? You turn blue and your lips turn black. In other words, these are depictive of uh, dead creatures. Right. And another thing is that Smurfs is an all-male community. And you say, oh, there's Smurfette. She's a female. 
Well, in one cartoon, she was depicted as transforming from a male to a female through magical power. And so the only female in the Smurfs is transformed from a male. She was not born a female. Now, what you're telling me then is that even Smurfs carry a homosexual connotation in that most of them are male. I believe so. How many of you were ever warned about these? Oh, you roll the devil's dice, you will pay a heavy price. Here's one of the earliest incarnations of advanced D&D, Dungeons and Dragons. Raise your hand if you've ever been a druid, a paladin, a sorcerer, a warlock. Oh, you guys are on a slippery slope straight to hell. You didn't just play a game, and this was the narrative within Christian circles. You didn't just play the game. You were playing with fire. You ripped open the physical portals into a spiritual world and invited unholy congress with the devil. And there were conversations, there were news articles, there were whole commentaries about the dangers of D&D. It's more than a tool. It is something that injects witchcraft into the minds and lives of our children. Anybody here familiar with Chick Tracks? Okay. Well, if you're not familiar, Jack Chick was the guy who was responsible for the production of these little bitty comic books, these sort of apologetics religious comics. And they called them Chick Tracks, and they would hand them out and put them under windshield wipers of people's cars, and they put them irritatingly in people's trick-or-treat bags instead of candy and whatnot. And they've been distributed literally hundreds of millions of times. And Chick Tracks did an actual comic about D&D. They called it Dark Dungeons. This was released in 1984. The story revolving around two characters. First character was innocent little Debbie. She was really good at Dungeons and Dragons. In fact, she leveled up so high in D&D that her friend said, you know, you're really, really good at this in play. I think it's time to teach you how to do witchcraft in real life. And, is, and as is so true to real life, the dungeon master then took her off to a witch's coven <laughs> where they taught her how to be a high priestess and witch, and they changed her name to Elf Star, which I think sounds like a minivan. I'm just saying. <laughs> Second character's name is Marcy. Marcy played the game and died in the game. You ever play a video game and you die in the game? You play a kind of game and you'll die and you either have to re-enter or you have to wait till the game is over to play again. Marcy was playing D&D and her character died. Debbie goes over to check on Marcy. Hey, how's she doing? Oh, I'm so glad you're here, Debbie. She hasn't been herself since she died in the game. I really wish you'd go up to her room and talk some sense into her. And so Debbie climbs the stairs and yet what does she find? but Marcy swinging from a noose in her own bedroom surrounded by the icons of Dungeons and Dragons. Dungeons and Dragons, Jesus Christ, you might as well give your kids a loaded handgun. This is what they were telling us when we were young children. They were terrified of D&D. This is a guy, he's a character featured in Chick Tracks and some of these fictional stories, but he's actually a real life guy. He was a friend of Jack Chick. His name is John Todd. John Todd is or was, I think he's still around, a Christian apologist who claimed that before he accepted Jesus, he was a member of the Illuminati. <laughs> now, if you don't know what the Illuminati is, think of Spectre from the James Bond movies, okay? They're everywhere, they control everything. There was a 1980 graphic novel produced supposedly about his life called the Illuminati and witchcraft, talking about this puppet or this organization that's essentially controlling world governments and private corporations. And he was a member of it, and then he accepted Jesus and dedicated his life to exposing them. And in this particular chick track called Spellbound, which released in 1984, he said many of the most powerful satanic spells that they're targeting kids with comes from rock music. And as such, he advocated burning rock albums. And alarmingly, that's what many church youth groups did. In the 1980s, we saw quite a few people who burned their rock albums, and they would come back with stories. When I put this record in the fire, I heard screams. I heard the, the sounds of demons as they were sort of exorcised from the vinyl, right? Burn the witch in the 20th century. Whatever you do, you must expose and condemn the agents of sorcery among us, people like 
these guys. <laughs> oh, this is not a rock band. This is an attack on all that is good and righteous. These guys flick their devilish tongues. They breathe fire. They vomit blood. They have satanic orgies back in the green rooms and they spit their devilry in the face of Jesus Christ himself. We were told that KISS actually stood for something. Anybody here know what it is? I'm not crazy because these people knew we believe that KISS stood for Knights in Satan's service. More proof that the devil wanted to rock all night and party every day. I love this shot from Tenacious D. It just cracks me up. Anybody here warned about this guy? Ozzy Osbourne. He bites the heads off animals in concerts. And he's an agent of Beelzebub. He got his start back in 1968 as front man for the English rock band Black Sabbath. Hell, the moniker alone is an affront to God. Their debut album cover featured this creepy woman who was alleged by many to be a real life witch. And over the years, Christians just flipped out at songs like Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath, Children of the Grave, Lady Evil, and more. Also in On the Conspiracy in the 80s, we had Iron Maiden with the number of the beast. Anybody warned about Alice Cooper? <laughs> Alice Cooper, satanic. We were told that Stevie Nicks was a witch. Stevie Nicks would practice witchcraft, however, we did not know, but she practiced witchcraft at her concerts. We were taught this. ACDC, that doesn't stand for ACDC. ACDC isn't just a band name, it stands for Antichrist, Devil's Child. We were told and we believe this in the church. You want more proof that Satan was attempting to destroy the music industry in the 1980s? That has nothing to do with the satanic panic. I was just going through 80s music and I saw Don Johnson of Miami Vice in his album Heartbeat and had to toss it in there. It just seemed to fit. Anyone here familiar with the term backward masking or back masking? Okay. Well, bands ranging from Queen to Deep Purple to Slayer to the Eagles were allegedly embedding satanic messages, hiding them in the grooves of the albums that were released. So you play the song forward, you hear the song as recorded, you hear the lyrics as written, but if you were to stop and then take the finger on the record and spin it backwards, you would hear another message, a hidden message, a satanic message. Who knows what devilry you might uncover? And there were people who were spinning all kinds of albums backwards, looking for the voice of Satan and his minions. Now, prepare to be creeped out if this kind of thing creeps you out, but I'm gonna show you some examples. I'm gonna play for you a couple of clips, okay? Now, you gotta go back in time and remember what the context is like. I'm in sixth grade. All right, I'm in Mrs. Keck's homeroom sixth grade class and they bring in an expert on the occult. Now I'm already primed by fundamentalist parents to believe that the devil is everywhere and that there's a light and dark battle going on, a spiritual battle for the hearts of the planet and the end times are right upon us. Everything's a sign and this expert on the occult comes out and he plays these things for us and tells us that they are real. Imagine being a young, an impressionable young child and the effect it might have. Electric Light Orchestra, ELO, English rock band formed back in 1970. In 1974, they released the song El Dorado. Somebody found a hidden message discovered only when the song was played in reverse. Here it is, the clip forward. All right, take that very same clip and play it in reverse. What might you hear? Everyone who has the mark, the mark of the beast, lives. 
We were warned about the Beatles' counterculture influence, their ties to darker satanic themes. One specific song which contained hidden messages was Revolution 9 from the White Album. Now they had presented the album as sort of an experiment in artistry and sound design. Played forward, this clip from number nine sounds like this. Number nine, number nine, number nine, number nine, number nine, number nine, number nine. But play it backwards. What do you hear? Eroticism with the dead. Who what could be more satanic than that? The Beatles were already on Christianity's radar after John Lennon's comments two years earlier. He told the London Evening Standard that the Beatles were more popular than Jesus. Interestingly, the uh, listeners, believers in the UK, didn't give a shit. Nobody cared. But it was the United States Christians that absolutely hit the fan. They just flipped out about the Beatles. And they added the Beatles then to their sort of satanic blacklist. One more, real fast. Stairway to Heaven by Led Zeppelin. Arguably the most iconic rock song of the 20th century. When I was a teenager, I was told that this song had a hidden meaning. Hidden only when you play it in reverse can you reveal it. Here's the clip forward. What happens when you play this clip backward? Now, Christianity was freaking out. And it took about 30 seconds before clever marketers realized the value of purposefully, purposefully putting backward messages in rock songs. And so rock musicians started doing it on purpose. Hell, there was a Christian band called Petra. They had a song called Judas Kiss. They put in a backward mass thing. And if you spin it backwards, it says, what are you looking for the devil for when you ought to be looking for the Lord? That was the message. Weird Al Yankovic got in on it. He released the album in 3D in 1984. On that album is a song called Nature Trail to Hell where he did some backward masking. You want to hear the clip? Yeah. Check it out. Oh, oh yeah. Satan eats cheese with. <laughs> Satanic rock music became the scapegoat for every horrible headline in the world. If it's going wrong with your kids, check their albums, see what they're listening to. The sounds, the messages in their head might very well be coming from Satan. <laughs> and I totally got Aaron Ross permission to do this gag. <laughs> before I did it. Remember, this was in many ways a generation that was inclined to panic. They were inclined to paranoia. This was the time of Jerry Falwell and the moral majority, right? Calling out the decline of civilization, this sort of slippery slope into the clutches of self-indulgence and permissiveness and wickedness and sin. It was the time of the controversy about pop and rock music, remember? the Tipper Gore stuff and the Senate subcommittee hearings where they were talking about free, express free expression and warning labels. Here's a shot from the uh, PMRC hearing in 1985. Dee Snyder of Twisted Sisters giving testimony. Frank Zappa was there. John Denver was there defending free speech and expression through music. It was uh, the time of the Judas Priest lawsuit, 1990. Two guys got drunk 
and entered a suicide pact. They shot themselves. The grieving families found Judas Priest music in the kids' library and blamed the band. Took them to court. The judge dismissed it. It was the time of the Night Stalker, the serial killer Richard Ramirez, who killed 16 in California. He had claimed that the ACDC song Night Prowler inspired him to prowl into people's homes in the middle of the night and kill them. The Beatles' Helter Skelter was alleged to be the inspiration for the Manson murders of 1969. Charles Manson led a murderous commune that killed actress Sharon Tate and four other people in August of that year. Remember the 60s and 70s, this was the time of the celebrity serial killer, from Manson to the son of Sam to the Zodiac to John Wayne Gacy, Ted Bundy, and others. This is all feeding into a public attitude of fear, fear, fear. This was the time of the exorcist. Right? Remember people ran screaming from the theaters. We're jaded as a culture now, but at the time there were people who literally thought this was satanic. We brought the devil to planet Earth through film and actually starting with the book. It was the time of the Tylenol murders. Anybody remember that? Somebody slipped cyanide into Tylenol bottles, which prompted a nationwide recall of all Tylenol from the shelves. Jesus, you couldn't even trust your own medicines. People were scared. The time of the Procter and Gamble scandal. I remember this one. Christians everywhere stopped buying Procter and Gamble products. And this is everything from shampoo to toothpaste to dryer sheets to what I mean, they just make everything, right? Because they alleged that this symbol, which was the old Procter and Gamble symbol, was satanic with 13 stars. There's a horn at the top and the bottom of the half moon, and supposedly a 666 embedded in this guy's beard. There was an urban legend going on that the president of Procter & Gamble had appeared on the Phil Donahue talk show in 1994 and had said outright that he had a personal relationship with the Church of Satan and Procter & Gamble funneled millions of dollars to support the church and they didn't care because they're big enough it wouldn't, affect, it wouldn't affect their bottom line or profit margin. And so people stopped buying Procter & Gamble outright. They boycotted them. They wrote letters to the organization by the tens of thousands in protest. You are in league with the Church of Satan and its founder, Anton LaVey, founder, Church of Satan, and scary person, <laughs> called the Black Pope, the evilest man in the world. He was the author of the Satanic Bible, a book of, that none of us had actually read, but if someone had walked up to my doorstep holding a copy, I probably wouldn't have allowed them into my house. Right? Because everything's a conduit for satanic power or potential satanic power. It was the foundational book for LaVey's Church of Satan, founded in 1966, a satanic cult which prowled in the shadows of polite society. It kidnapped babies and it sacrificed animals and it gave Jesus the finger at every turn. What's the favorite holiday of the Church of Satan? Halloween. Satan's holiday. When I was growing up, we weren't allowed to dress up as anything with blood, anything having to do with witchcraft, anything like that. Usually it was just clowns and Bible characters is what we ended up growing, dressing up as. We heard horror stories about the stuff that happened on October 31st. Satanic rituals practiced on Halloween, the Devil's Day. We heard scary stories about people putting razor blades and apples and legions of kids being rushed to the emergency rooms. Whatever you do on Halloween, make sure to lock up your black cat, right? Lest it end up on someone's sacrificial altar. By the way, speaking of cats, I just thought this was funny. Someone sent me a cat meme, and it had the cat, and it said, Every time a cat cleans itself, it is worshiping the Dark Lord. <laughs> cats may be satanic, I'll give you that. They may be on to something. Why do we think Dana Carvey's church lady was so popular? Why was the church lady so popular during that time? Because Dana Carvey and Saturday Night Live had tapped into the temperature of the culture where everything was about Satan. The constant warnings from the Bible bangers about Satan. I was in, I think, eighth grade at Eastwood School, Christian school, private school, again, the product of a fundamentalist culture. They brought the entire student body in for a special chapel services. Chapel is essentially church for your school, and they, you have to wear a tie on those days and slacks, and we all come in, and we have church. But they had a special screening of three films over the course of, I think, three weeks. The Thief in the Night series. 
These were produced from 1972 to 1981. They depicted the end times, literally, the rapture happens. People worldwide disappear, leaving behind those poor sinners who get caught in a meat grinder of a one world government that mandates they must take the mark of the beast and join Satan. And if they do not, what happens? According to the film, if you say no, it's not too late to accept Jesus after the rapture. You can still go to heaven, but if you profess Jesus and accept him after the rapture and you don't take the mark, according to the films, they drag you to a public square and they execute you by guillotine. This was shown to young children, and I am convinced to this day this constitutes child abuse. This was shown. to an entire student body. At the end, people are terrified. People are trembling. There are tears gushing out of their eyes. And then what do the pastors and chapel leaders say to the children? So who would like to come forward and accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior? It looked like the Boston Marathon just kicked off. Everybody's running forward to the altar. Please, Jesus, save me from this. Back to Halloween, this guy's name is Mike Warnke. He professed to be a former Satanist high priest. He wrote and produced a Christian perspective on Halloween and the devil, the satanic influences in our culture. He wrote a book called The Satan Seller, which released in 1978. He followed that up in 91 with the schemes of Satan. And he professed to be a Satanist high priest and drug abuser. And you know, they were chopping people's fingers off and sacrificing animals and drinking blood and just horror stories. And he went on to become, believe it or not, a Christian comedian and ran a multi-million dollar global ministry, a very successful one. 1980 saw the release of a best-selling book called Michelle Remembers about Michelle Smith. Michelle Smith, according to the book, was subjected to horrible satanic ritual abuse as a child and then blocked out or repressed the memories. And it was a psychiatrist who was able to go in there and delve deep into her psyche and uncover all the horrible things she'd gone through. Torture, locking in cages, she'd been assaulted, forced into rituals, many of those rituals lasting over 80 days. She witnessed murder. It was just horrible, horrible stuff. And of course, we saw headlines about satanic ritual abuse globally. Protect your kids. Daycares and children's schools, they're all, they're molesting children and doing horrible rituals in the name of Satan himself. Real fast, law enforcement, by the way, was involved with some of this. Here is a video that was produced for and targeted to law enforcement called The Law Enforcement Guide to Satanic Cults. It was hosted by a former police officer turned pastor named Gordon Coulter. Now for reasons that you're about to see, I'd like to retitle this video. I would like to retitle it, Uncle Gordy Wants to Make You a Video Star. <laughs> it's creepy, this clip. It's an hour and a half video. I'm just going to show you like 60 seconds. It's creepy and not for the reasons intended. I've added bottom of the screen commentary of my own. Here we go. Besides, there are some very obvious ritualistic markings that will appear on a body that is the result of satanic killings. But some of the markings are a little more subtle. And so what we're going to do is give you an illustration of this on our model and also retrace some of the markings that were in the St. Joseph's case. You'll note on our model that there's oftentimes a cut that goes from behind the ear all the way down to the throat. Another area that's obvious in these kinds of ritualistic carvings would be the pentagram or the inverted pentagram on the right and the left side of the upper chest. This oftentimes is the signature of the high priest. Another area that you might find satanic ritual carving is in the stomach area. And as was true in the St. Joseph's case. All right, we laugh about this stuff, right? We laugh about it. But the truth is, is that the satanic panic destroyed, it destroyed lives. Of course, you can't talk about the satanic panic without talking about the daycare sexual abuse trial, the McMartin trial, the McMartin family, the McMartin daycare. They were accused 
of satanic ritual abuse. From 1983 to 1990, this trial went on, a trial that mesmerized the nation. It was featured on Geraldo Rivera's 1998 television special, Devil Worship Exposing Satan's Underground. It was about the occult and devil worship and satanic ritual abuse and the things that could be dangerous to our kids. And he talked to Ozzy Osbourne and McMartin parents and the widow of Anton LaVey. This was a steamy pile of sensationalistic horseshit that Geraldo himself would have to come back later and apologize for, and he should, for both feeding on and feeding into one of the biggest lies of the late 20th century. How much of this insanity might have been prevented if people had taken a fraction of the time and energy they spent freaking and they had used that to fact check just a few things. Back to the Pokemon creator and the Time Magazine interview. The infamous interview. He never once mentioned his religion, never once mentioned Christianity, never one, once mentioned his parents. He certainly never said that Pokemon was created to be satanic. He just talked about the development of the game. It was a very sort of benign interview about creating the game itself. All the uh, insanity about Procter and Gamble, total crap, totally bogus. No ties to the Church of Satan at all. This was created by largely illiterate dock workers so they could find shipping crates on the dock at a time when many people simply couldn't read. They just used the symbols. In fact, as I understand it, the 13 stars were there to represent the original 13 colonies. How about this? The Donahue interview never happened. The president of the Procter & Gamble organization never appeared on Donahue, and some of the incarnations of this urban legend actually have them on other shows, like Oprah and Sally, Jesse, Raphael. They can't even get the urban legends to line up. For all of this, though, Procter & Gamble ended up changing its logo because it was getting like 20,000 protest phone calls a month by indignant Christians who would not research for themselves. How about this guy, Christian comedian Mike Warnke, former Satanist high priest. Cornerstone Magazine did a 1992 investigation. Actually, the investigation went on much longer. And they talked to like 100 people from his youth and immediate surroundings and realized that there's no supporting evidence for any of the shit he was saying on his albums, from the stage, in his books, relating to Satanism. It appears he made everything up. When this news went out, Mike Warnke's ministry imploded. It imploded. How about this guy? Anton LaVey? He was an atheist. The founder of the Church of Satan does not believe in a literal Satan. He uses Satan as sort of a framework for his own philosophy on living and because he likes scaring little blue-haired church ladies <laughs> all around the world. That's why LaVey used it. The more church freaked out, the more he loved it, right? And what about all this talk about kidnapping of children and harming animals? Well, if you read the 11 satanic rules of the earth, it commands, it instructs, don't harm kids and don't kill non-human animals unless you're attacked or for your food. What about this book from 1980, Michelle Remembers? About satanic ritual abuse and all these repressed memories? They investigated this, total crap, total bullshit. During the time she was supposedly undergoing this 80-day satanic ritual, she showed perfect attendance at her school along with all the other kids. How hard is this to fact check? The McMartin trial was based on what? Largely on the stories of young children. Now, I want to be careful here because we never want to just discount what children tell us in regard to abuse. We need to be listening, but we also need to be fact checking. And when a child comes to you like the McMartin kids and starts spinning these stories, kids told investigators that inside the McMartin facility, people, witches, were flying around on brooms. That's pretty easy to fact check, isn't it? <laughs> they said that the children were transported to and from in hot air balloons. Somebody might have seen that, don't you think? They were abused in tunnels underneath the facility. How hard is it to grab a fucking shovel and see that there are no tunnels under the McMartin daycare? What about one child who reported that the McMartins were flushing children down the toilet? <laughs> Simple physics allows us to scratch this one off the list. One child was asked to pick his abuser out of a photo lineup, and you know who he picked? And I shit you not, he picked Chuck Norris. <laughs> 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 
the most expensive trial in the United States to that time, and lives destroyed. The McMartins never recovered. They never recovered. There was a history in these trials of people using suggestive interviewing techniques with these young children. Hey, you give me the answer I want, you tell me you were abused, and I'll give you a toy, I'll give you some candy. You'll have been a good boy. You don't want to be a bad boy, do you? Hugely suspect. HBO actually produced a compelling film in 1995 about the McMartin fiasco. Fear, insanity, paranoia, time lost, money wasted, lives devastated. How about this couple? They were convicted in the 90s of satanic ritual abuse on hearsay eyewitness evidence. Took them a quarter of a century for that to get thrown out because there was no evidence to support it. Their lives were ruined, why? Because they were caught in a tidal wave of superstitious paranoia. All right, fine, Seth, we get it. Please get to the point. I hear you. Why dredge it all up now in the year 2017? What's the relevance of the satanic panic today? My point, my friends, is this. The satanic panic is not over. The fundamentals of Christianity teach what? The devil's a schemer and he's out there to deceive the world. He's going to ensnare us to steal, kill, and destroy. The whole world today lies in his power. You got people like Billy Graham warning about Satan. Don't ever think he's not to be feared. People still base entire sermons, hell, whole apologetics, websites and books on the end times narrative, which revolve around Satan, the book of Revelation taught as fact. We have exorcisms done by the thousands in the 21st century. This guy here on the left, Reverend Amorth, allegedly did 10,000 of them before he died. Many of these exorcisms done by different people in different contexts have harmed or even killed those being exorcised. What about the warnings about the evils of rock music? That seems so 80s, right? This is a clip from just a couple of years ago from mega pastor in Texas, John Hagee. I let my teenager listen to rock music because that's all he'll listen to. Let me tell you, so the lyrics to real rock music is nothing more than satanic cyanide. Get it out of your house, throw it out, and burn it. It has no place in the house of the righteous. Burn your rock music. Now, I can see a couple of contexts where this might be appropriate. I... <laughs> I'm, I don't have anything against Nickelback. It's such a good punchline, I had to throw it in there. Why are people freaking out so much when Lucian Greaves and the Satanic Temple are trying to put up Baphomet statues next to the Ten Commandments on taxpayer property? Why are they flipping out? Because they're terrified of Satan. Why do so many people invoke Pascal's wager? Oh, I'd rather believe and be wrong because I don't want to go to hell. That's a fear statement. Why do so many churches promote hell houses and judgment houses every October where they bring these kids in at these haunted houses that are based around the book of Revelation and they have the devil and their actors in their youth who's covered in blood or writhing and screaming this could happen to you. Why do churches still indoctrinate young children to fear and escape the devil? Because the satanic panic is alive and well. No matter how many love verses it preaches, Christianity is at its foundation a fear culture. From the beginning of the Bible to the end, its whole narrative hinges on making people irrationally afraid of the devil, afraid of dark forces, and afraid of hell. From the serpent in the garden in the book of Genesis, the agent of Lucifer come to steal and deceive, to the Satan of Revelation who will be bound for a thousand years and ultimately destroyed. He is the linchpin for Christianity. He's the reason to surrender to God, the reason to accept, the reason to line up, to bow down, to obey. And I think it's so important for humankind to break these chains, to no longer give ourselves to the irrational, the plays upon our greatest fears, the human tendencies to just flip out anytime somebody who looks like an authority figure spins a scary story. As an evolved and evolving species, we have to open that closet door. We have to examine it and realize there is no monster there. No ghosts, no spirits, no devils, no demons, no boogeyman come to steal our souls. 
It took me 18, after I said I was an atheist, it took me a year and a half to get over my fear of hell, losing sleep over being wrong and being tortured forever. But I now know that we can't acknowledge and understand how religions use fear to control people. They want to own us. We can turn away from that fear. We can turn and walk toward the rational, toward the real challenges and opportunities before us, toward freedom, real freedom. As somebody who was once controlled by all this, I want you to know, hell, I want the world to know that while there are some genuinely scary things out there in this world, there's no need to be afraid of a mythical Satan, of the human-made villain playing to Jesus' hero figure, of gods or monsters. Just flip that switch. Illuminate those claims. Put them under the white-hot light of scrutiny. Discover the truth. Be free. As this commenter on Twitter said it so aptly just two days ago, I had to copy it. He said, it's sad when you have imaginary friends. It's even sadder when you have imaginary enemies. <laughs> let us, my friends, put away the imaginary. And let us work together to help other people do the same. And let's focus on the very real problems and opportunities before us. If I can close with that famous quote from Plato, he said this, we can easily forgive a child who's afraid of the dark. The real tragedy of life is when men are afraid of the light. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you.